the title today's sermon. Um, you can give it a subtitle, Who Can Forgive Sins But God Alone? And that is the main point of the portion that we're going to be reading this morning. We're going to see here that the Lord Jesus Christ has the power and the authority to forgive sins. And for those of you who have experienced the joy and the reality of forgiven sin, you and I would both say that there is nothing like it. Because when the burden of sin and guilt is lifted off your shoulders, nothing compares to it. Well, we are in Mark again, chapter 2. But in Mark chapter 1, we've discovered a few things. And we continue to see who the Lord Jesus is and what the Lord Jesus Christ can do for us. The first thing we've discovered so far in Mark chapter 1 is that Jesus has the power over sin. Jesus has the power over Satan. And we saw that when Jesus Christ was led into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit to be tempted of the devil for 40 days and 40 nights. Did Jesus ever cave in? Not one time. That tells you that our Lord has authority and power over all sin and over every attack and temptation that the enemy tries to throw at him. The second thing we discovered was Jesus has the power over demons. He has the power over demons. And we've read so far that he's driven out many demons from people's hopeless lives. The Lord has power over demons. He tells them to shut up and they do. He tells them to leave and flee and they obey. The third thing we've learned so far is that Jesus has the power to teach with heavenly authority. Heavenly authority. Remember, he was in a synagogue and he was teaching and the people said, no one has ever spoken like this man with this kind of authority. It was the kind of power that made them shudder within themselves. It was different. He didn't teach like the scribes of the Pharisees. When he spoke, it was as though God himself was speaking to us. The fourth thing we learned was that Jesus has the power to heal. Heal. Even the worst cases of infirmities, like leprosy, like we read about a month ago. The Lord Jesus has the power to heal. And he is going to exercise that power completely when all of us get to heaven, right? If there is a paralytic in the house, if there is one that is struggling with different illnesses like cancer and tumors and all of these things that fallen humanity has to go through and suffers through, one day we will be in heaven with the Lord and there will not be one disease found in all his kingdom, right? So he's going to solidify his power over death and over sickness. And one day we will be there and we will be completely healed even of aging. Praise God. <clears throat> Amen. The older one said, Amen. Amen. Now he's preaching. <laughs> I didn't think it was going to show up this morning. <laughs> And now we're going to discover that the Lord Jesus Christ has the power to forgive sin. I don't know about you, but that's a powerful Christ. That's a very powerful God-man. Power over sin, power over demons, power to teach with heavenly authority, power to heal anyone. Power, power to forgive all our sins. We serve a mighty and powerful Jesus. Let us open our Bibles here to Matthew, uh, Mark, chapter 2. We're going to read verses 1 to 12. Rip the roof off, and we'll see what all that means. Your subtitle may read, Jesus forgives and heals a paralytic. Starting at verse 1. And again, he, speaking of Jesus, entered Capernaum after some days. Well, as you know, he was um, not allowed into cities anymore and was out in deserted places because of the leprous man that he healed. And now he's back on track and back into people's houses and eventually synagogues. So here we read, And it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately many gathered together so that there was no room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. Then they came to him, 
bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof. They ripped the roof off where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But immediately, when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned with that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, Why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven you? Or to say, Arise, take up your bed and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, Arise, Take up your bed and go to your house. Immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went out in the presence of them all, so that all were amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. We never saw anything like this. It says, It was heard that he was in the house. Whenever you hear Jesus is around, you better run to where he is, right? It says also, there was no longer room, not even near the door. Now you can imagine this scene. It's, it's pretty dramatic, really. Sometimes we read over these stories and we become so familiar with them that they really don't do anything to us. But let's revisit the story and let's imagine what all of this must have looked like and felt like. Listen, the people were tense. People were all crammed up like sardines in a can, right? And, and then you had some men trying to get in from the roof because there's no room in the door. And then you had the owner of the house tense because his roof is being broken into, right? And the Lord Jesus Christ is being interrupted as he's preaching the word. And then the scribes are right there angry at Jesus for what he said and what he's doing. I mean, there's it's, it's a lot of people were uh, um, very tensed. At this time. Here we have a jam-packed house where Jesus was preaching. I mean, I can't say this enough. The main ministry Jesus had was that of preaching the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven. Why? Because that is the power in which God uses to save the sinner. To open eyes. To give new hearts. To give new life. Faith comes by what? Hearing the word of God. And so Jesus preached. He was a preacher everywhere he went. At this point, the crowds are very curious about Jesus because his fame was spreading throughout all the regions because of what he was able to do, because of the way he spoke, the authority he had. So he was, he was becoming very popular at this time. People were very curious and wanted to be around him. But for the most part, the majority of those who came were curious, but not committed. There were very few who were actually committed to who Jesus was and what Jesus said. Most of the people were just spectators and speculating on whether or not they should believe and follow him. And so then that would beg the question here this morning, are you just curious or are you committed? Those who are committed are getting in and those who remain curious without a commitment are staying out forever be committed amen? amen committed to his person committed to his teachings it says here that they uncovered the roof notice how just determined these four friends of the paralytic man were they were extremely determined a full house with no way in was not going to stop them. I mean, for some of us, we would see the scene and say, probably not. Wasn't going to stop these men from getting their friend's blessing. And all they really wanted was for their friend to walk again. Maybe to play some football together once again. 
They just wanted him to walk again. But what did he get? He got more than that. He got the forgiveness of his sins that leads to salvation in Jesus Christ. But they were going to do everything they could to get the man in the house, to get the man to be touched by the Lord Jesus Christ. They literally tore, they dug into and ripped open the roof. I wonder what the homeowner was thinking once again. Who's going to pay for that? Who's going to pay for my roof right now? Listen, if this isn't desperation and faith, I don't know what is. Could it be that the four friends were thinking in their mind, if we can't go in through the door, we'll go in through the roof. That's desperation. Whatever obstacles in my way, I'm going to touch the Lord. He's going to be mine. No blocked doors are going to stop me. No sin, no desire, nothing is going to stop me from touching the Lord Jesus Christ by faith and being saved and spiritually healed, right? Most houses had roofs that were accessible from a, sto a stairway outside. There were all one-story homes and there was a stairway on the outside, not the inside, Later on, they got a little more clever, and the stairs, they put them inside. These roofs were made of wooden beams, thatch, that is dry grass, mud, and those who had extra money had tiles. They had to make a huge hole on this roof in order to get their, their buddy in this house. So the hole had to be anywhere from four feet to six feet, or four by seven feet. But it had to be big enough to let the man in and his bed. So these men were working very hard on this roof. So when they broke through, they let down the bed. Finally, we can get our buddy into that room. No one's going to stop us. Again, this was an intense scene. For one, no preacher likes to be interrupted. And here we have Jesus teaching. And all of a sudden, he hears pounding on the roof right above his head. Boom, boom, boom. Who is that? All of a sudden, dirt begins to fall on his head. And they finally make a hole. And the sun's rays begin to enter the room. And everybody's looking up. Boom. Boom. And the Lord all along knows what's happening. These men are breaking through to touch the Savior. These men were desperate. And... They had not only the Lord's attention, but everyone's attention. And anyone who's truly desperate for Jesus Christ gets the Lord's attention and everyone's attention. Because desperation is one in a million. And if you have it, it'll save your soul. And if you have it, it's because you know you need the Lord. Can I get an amen? amen. And so, again, the dirt's flying, booms left and right. They're trying to get in no matter what. All, all five are up there on the roof and everybody's looking up. Four men letting their buddy inside the room. What was all this? This was desperate times calls for desperate measures, right? These big hearted men serve an as an example for us. What can we learn from these four men? What barriers or obstacles would stop us from bringing a loved one to our Lord Jesus Christ? What, what barriers would stop us from bringing a friend or, or bringing a stranger to the Lord Jesus Christ? Would you, would you break open, a, would you rip the, the roof off? <laughs> what, what, what would stop you? What would be too much? How inconvenienced are you willing to be to win a soul? How inconvenienced are you willing to be to win a soul? There's a new song written by Casting crowns. I don't remember exactly how it goes, but there is a line in this new song that says, would we even cross the street to get to a person who needs Christ, basically? Would we even cross the street? I'll tell you one thing, many Christians won't even cross the street. How often do we go out of our way to bring a soul to Jesus? Are we at all like these four men? Or would we say again, it's no use. The house is crammed. 
The doors are blocked. Let's just call it a day, boys, and go back home. It's no use. We're not getting in. At least we tried. How do you think that their buddy laying there on the bed who can't move a muscle would feel or respond to their lack of love, their lack of courage, their lack of tenacity, their lack of faith? What if they said, ah, let's just go back home. We're not going to get in. These men were determined not to let their friend down, down through the roof, yes, but not to fail him. May this story stir our hearts in regards to evangelism. Again, how far are we willing to go to win a soul? And listen, we may not vandalize a building. A building. I hope you don't. Um, <laughs> We may never rip the roof off, if you will. We may, may never tear a door down, if you will. But we do set people free with the truth of God's Word, don't we? In a sense, when we're witnessing to people who are bound to lies, the lies of the world, we begin to tell them about Jesus and explain certain truths. And little do you know, we're taking off one tile at a time from their hearts and their minds. You we're able to break strongholds. People are bound by lies, by demonic forces, and you have the truth that can set them free. Amen? And so again, we do fight for souls. We can break strongholds again by speaking biblical truth or by praying earnestly for the souls that we love. That's like breaking in through the roof right there. When you're praying earnestly, relentlessly, with passion and faith for the salvation of your loved ones, it's like you pounding on that roof. It catches the Lord's attention and the Lord may answer your prayer. We can spend time with the people we love. We can meet their needs, their immediate needs. These four men were real friends to this paralytic man. And if they were not close friends, even if they were strangers, they were strangers with big hearts. It is said that friends don't let friends drive drunk. I say friends don't let friends go to hell without a fight. Friend, yes, give God praise. <laughs> friends don't let friends go to hell without a fight. Keep in mind that, that your faith in Jesus can be contagious. Your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ can be very contagious depending on the, on the intensity and the reality of your faith. The more visible it is, the more audible it is, the more contagious it is. It's possible that the faith of the four men fueled the faith of this paralytic man. I can hear the conversation now. The paralytic man speaking. Do you guys really think that the Lord Jesus will heal me? The four men looking into his eyes with confidence. Yes! Of course He can heal you. That's why we're breaking the roof off this place. Are you sure He can heal me? And they answer, of course, we believe it. And we're going to prove to you just how much we believe it by breaking this roof off, by breaking through this roof of a house that doesn't even belong to us. <clears throat> Listen, when we talk about the power of the Lord Jesus, our faith in Him and what He's done for us, this can spark a, a small flame of saving faith in someone's heart. I believe that some people don't even come to Jesus just because we don't express our faith in His power, in His love. People, they wonder. Can the Lord really do for me what He did for you? And you tell Him, oh, absolutely. Are you sure? But, but I committed this sin. He'll forgive that sin on top of a million other sins you have hidden. And so people, they just, 
They want to know what the Lord can do for them. And you know exactly what the Lord can do for them because you know what the Lord has done for you. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. When Jesus saw their faith, whose faith? The faith of all five. The faith of all five. He said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. This is the main point of the scene. That Jesus being divine has the power to forgive sin. This is the greatest blessing any of us could ever experience. The forgiveness of God. Can you picture it? Jesus tells a paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven. Could it be that the men who were on the roof looked down and said, no, not, we're not asking for the forgiveness of his sins. We just want him healed. We want our friend walking. Wrong blessing, Lord. <laughs> sins, seriously, the man is laying in front of you. He can't walk. He says, your sins are forgiven you. This shows us just how important spiritual healing is than physical healing. Forgiveness of sin and a new heart is superior to physical wellness. Amen. That's the reason why preaching crusades, in my opinion, are far greater of importance than, well, nowadays, right? So called uh, physical crusades, uh, physical healing crusades. The Word of God. What heals the soul is much more important. To be right with God through faith, forgiveness and salvation, again, is the ultimate blessing. Why? Because for one, we're made right with God through forgiveness, we're saved, and we're rescued from eternal torment. People don't go to hell because they've sinned. They go to hell because their sin is unforgiven. This man's sin is forgiven. And if you're in Christ, so are your sins forgiven. Amen? Amen? Again, there is no sweeter feeling in the soul than to know that our sins have been forgiven. Than to know that Jesus washed away our sins and lifted up the guilt that was weighing us down in our souls. And to know that your sentence was paid for on the cross. Listen to me, there's nothing greater than that. To know that you are forgiven and free. That the Lord will not cast you into hell for your crimes. There's nothing like it. And forgiveness is kind of in a sense the door. The doorway to a relationship with God. A relationship doesn't even begin until you are truly forgiven and free and saved by the Lord. So forgiveness is absolutely crucial. Amen? How is one forgiven? They repent and believe. We will need to turn from their ways and believe in all that Jesus is and all that Jesus has said and all that Jesus has done. That's true saving faith. To not just be curious, but to be committed. To know that you've been born again. To know that the triune God lives inside of your heart and you know it and you would die for it in a heartbeat. Why? Because you are convinced through and through, that God lives in you. That is true salvation. Amen? It's one of the most beautiful and heart-rejoicing truths and characteristics of true Christianity, that a sinner can be forgiven of any sin and made right with God by genuine faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. There are so many false religions in the world today, they promise many things, but they can't forgive you of your sins. The Lord Jesus Christ can. The Lord Jesus Christ can. Again, I don't know of a sweeter sense in the soul than the forgiveness of sin. This is the love and the grace of God that we experience within our hearts. This is a gift from the Lord. To know that your sin debt has been dealt with and paid for. That it's been canceled because Jesus took our punishment upon Himself on that cross. It's wonderful. You look at yourself and say, wow, apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, I am guilty, guilty, guilty. But the Lord Jesus Christ says, you are forgiven, forgiven, forgiven. It says here that he saw their faith. True faith is visible. 
True faith is visible. Faith is always followed by action. The Apostle James says, without faith, faith without works is what? Dead. These men were proving their faith by pounding on that roof. How have you proved your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? To what extent have you followed the Lord? What cost have you paid? What have you abandoned? Faith is costly. These five men expressed their faith by ripping up the roof to get to Jesus. They just knew that the Lord Jesus Christ wasn't going to let their potent faith down. The Lord saw their faith. And the Lord sees your faith. And the Lord sees my faith. He sees if our faith is genuine, if it's real, if it's pounding on that roof. If it's obeying. If it's desperate. Right? The Lord knows our faith. He sees it. He sees it by our actions. If Noah would have, told, if Noah would have said he believed in God but didn't obey by building the ark, God wouldn't have believed him. You and I wouldn't have believed him, right? All faith is followed by holy action towards God. All true faith. It says here, and the scribes, that is the Jewish scholars of Jesus' day. These were the theologians of the Old Testament. The scribes, who were to be the, the, the great ones, the, the bright ones of society. The scribes were there. And the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Notice all of their reasoning happens inside. Not a word was spoken. Here we find that Jesus was able to supernaturally read their hearts and their minds. Remember, they're reasoning in their hearts at this time in this house. Nothing is being said audibly. And Jesus proves this divine, that He is divine, or that this divine godlike ability by answering their internal, nonverbal, and non audible questions. I don't know about you, but this alone should have shocked the scribes. We're thinking this. He's hearing us. We haven't said a word, and he knows exactly what we're saying. I mean, that was enough to point to the divinity of Christ. I don't know what you're thinking. You don't know what I'm thinking, but the Lord knows what everyone is thinking. He's a reader of the heart. He's a reader of the mind. And so this alone should have shocked them. They should have said, wow, he can read my mind right now. I don't think I said this out loud. But it didn't. Why? Because their hearts were hardened. And some people will hear me right now and you won't believe because maybe your heart is hardened. But the Lord is already ex showing Himself to even the scribes. By the way, the Lord again reads all hearts and knows all thoughts, good or bad. God's Word has the power to read hearts and answer internal questions. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 says, For the Word of God is alive and active. In other words, it's doing something always. Sharper than any two-edged sword. It's like a surgeon going into the heart, right? Cutting right through. It penetrates even to the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow, cutting right through the chest area, spiritually speaking, getting right into the heart. Cutting through the bone and the marrow, going all the way, piercing, it says here. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. When Jesus was speaking, all of their intentions, all of their questions, all of their doubts, their worries, even their malice at times was visible to the all-seeing eyes of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Word of God reads hearts. I've had people come up to me after service and tell me 
that they came to church with a specific question. And that as soon as I was done preaching God's word, that question was answered. Or there are some individuals who are struggling with specific detailed sin that I, have, I know nothing about. And then they'll come up and say, hey, were you just targeting just me? Was your preaching just aimed at me because you just nailed the specific sin I'm dealing with? That's not me. That's the Lord's word. That's the spirit of God. That's when Jesus is in the house. Amen. And yes, a pastor may address the sins of the church in a very careful and loving way. But there are times when he knows nothing, but God knows everything. And he is speaking to his people. Amen? God's word is powerful, church. And these scribes felt a little bit of that. But they denied it. They brushed it off. It's, it's, just gotta, it's, it's probably just us that he's reading our minds right now. It's probably just us, you know, trying to deny the reality of the Lord's power. Why does this man speak blasphemies like this, they said, in their hearts, within themselves? In other words, who does this creature of the dirt think he is? When they say man, that's what they mean. Adam came from what? Dirt. Who does this Adam from the dirt think he is? They said, why does this man made of dirt speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sin but God alone? Well, they were scribes and they knew that the only one who can forgive sins is God. They, they knew that much. But I think they forgot that God can also read hearts and minds. Listen, either Jesus is God or he's a blasphemer. There is no third option. That's what you can get out of that verse right there. Either he's a blasphemer because he claimed to be divine time and time and time again, or he is who he says he is and claims to be, and that is God the Son. Yahweh the Son. So when people say that they believe Jesus is a good man or some great teacher... They try to compare him to other worldly teachers, maybe even give him a higher pedestal than other men. But they don't see him as either a, a kook, right, a blasphemer, or one who disrespects God, or, or divine as God. These people are not really making any sense. Because Jesus Christ claimed to be God time and time and time again. So for you just to say, well, there's a third option. He's just a good guy. The Bible doesn't allow us to conclude that. The Bible allows you to conclude two things. He's a blasphemer or he's God. That's it. Those are the only two options you have. That's it. And we believe that he is what? God. He is God. There is no third option. Jesus is God or he is a blasphemer. And that's the point he's going to make before this crowd and before the scribes. You call me a blasphemer, but I'm going to prove, prove to you that I am God by what I'm about to do next. Right? Jesus says, why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise, get up, take up your bed and walk. This was an interesting question. I'm sure it got their marbles turning. But they were silent. Because a mere man, a mere human being, or for a mere man, or for a mere human being, it is impossible to say and actually do either. If you're just a man... You cannot say to someone that their sins are forgiven and for that to be a reality and you can't tell a paralytic man to get up and walk. Right? It's impossible for a mere man to do this. It's impossible for a mere man to forgive sin in a salvific way or to supernaturally perform miracles. But if a man can do it, if a man can do that, 
then that man is more than just a man. He is God. And that's what Jesus' point is. I mean, Jesus is preaching here. They interrupted his preaching, and it turned possibly, I can't say into a better one, because the Lord doesn't make any mistakes, but he used the opportunity to prove who he is. So now he wasn't just speaking, he was doing. And they were able to see his power and possibly believe. So, what's the, the answer to this? Is it easier to merely say, again, merely say your sins are forgiven, or is it easier to, to make a paralyzed man walk? That's, that's really what his question was. Is it easier just to say this, or is it easier to command this guy to get back on his feet? What's easier? Well, the answer would be it's easier to merely say your sins are forgiven. Why? Because we can't validate that the man is truly forgiven. But if you say or tell the man to, the paralyzed man to get up and walk, his walking is the validation. Do you see what I'm saying? If he says your sins are forgiven, who knows if they're really forgiven? They don't even believe he's God to begin with. But if he tells the man to get up on his feet, if he tells him to do something that is impossible, then that proves that Jesus Christ is God. Amen? Amen. And that was the point of the story. He's telling him what's easier to do, just to say something or to actually do something that no mere man can do. I love the Lord Jesus Christ. I love the way he ministers to people. I love the way he challenges people. There's no one like him. There's no one like him. Amen? Amen. In a sense, again, it's easier, to immediate, it's easier to immediately see a crippled man walk than to see the forgiveness of sin. You see it with your eyes. The man's up and going. Forgiveness you can't really see right away. And so the Lord was saying, I'm, I'm going to do what's more difficult. And, and I'm not saying that it's more, it's more difficult to heal someone physically than it is to forgive someone, but it's more difficult to actually do the miraculous work than just to say you're forgiven, right? Action. And the Lord did it. He says, but so that you may know. That's the whole point of Jesus' ministry, and that's the whole point of Yahweh's ministry in the Old Testament. Every single time he did something, he said, so that you may know that I am the Lord. It's the same heart in the New Testament. He could have said the exact same words. So that you may know that I am the Lord. He says, so that you may know that the Son of Man has the power to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go home. And it happened. He's a forgiver of sins, and he proved it by healing this man right before their very eyes. Something they cannot deny. If he can get this paralyzed man to walk again, then he must be able to forgive sins. Jesus has the power to forgive sins because he is God. And because He bore our sin on Himself for the world on the cross. This man's sin can't be forgiven just because. This man's sin could be forgiven because Jesus is on His way to die for this man's sin in this man's place. All sin must be paid for. And those who trust in Jesus Christ have their sins paid for. That's the point. He bore the penalty of sin in order to offer forgiveness so that anyone who believes by committing their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ and His perfection may have their sins erased, eradicated, forgiven. This is good news. Listen carefully. Jesus addresses Himself as the Son of Man. The Son of Man. What does that mean? You can just read right over that and say there might not be too much weight with those words. There might not be too much meaning with those words. But I would have you know that this is the title that Jesus Christ used for himself more than any other title during his earthly ministry. 
He called himself Son of Man more than any other name, more than Christ, more than the Son of God, more than other, other titles. The Son of Man. Why the Son of Man? Why the Son of Man? It's not a title of earthly humility. Some will say, oh, that's just a title of earthly humility, like the Son of Man, like He was born of Mary. Yes, it does point to the fact that He's God and He is man, He's human, but there's more than that. There's more than that. It's a title of pure heavenly power and authority. Let's turn our Bibles to Daniel chapter 7. We're going to read verses 13 and 14. Here, the prophet Daniel prophesies of the Lord Jesus Christ. He has a vision of the Lord. And listen to what he says about the Son of Man. When you're there, go ahead and say amen. amen. Daniel 7, 13 to 14. Remember the title, Son of Man. This is what Jesus called himself at this time in this packed house. Daniel speaking says... I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. That's the Lord's second coming. He came to the Ancient of Days. That's a name for His Father, God the Father. And they brought Him near before Him. That's referring to His resurrection when He appeared before His Father. Then to Him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve Him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and His kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. Who is this Son of Man? He's the all-powerful King of the universe. Dominion in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. The king who rules as Lord. What was he saying to this peop these people? I'm the coming Messiah. I'm the Christ. I'm the son of man. That's what he says. But this title would go over their heads. But it wouldn't go over the scribes' heads. This title wouldn't go over the Pharisees' heads. I can guarantee you that these Pharisees that were doubting who Jesus was connected the Son of Man, what he called himself, with Daniel chapter 7, 13 and 14. But because of their pride, because of their pride, they missed him. They missed him. So he's not just anyone. And he didn't use this title because he was trying to be humble. He was using this title because he knew that he had all authority. And that his kingdom has no end. And that his power is greater than any power in the universe. When the Lord Jesus said, the Son of Man has the power on earth to forgive sins. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. Jesus is the Son of Man. He's the Son of God too. And he has come to this earth as the one who has absolute authority over the entire world, over the invisible and visible realm, over visible and invisible kingdoms, and over every heart of a true believer. Amen? Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ reigns over all, and it says that His dominion is everlasting and it will not pass away. And then it says there, we conclude with, in verse 12, Immediately he rose, took up the bed, and went out in the presence of them all, so that all were amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. That's the point of all ministry. That when people hear you speak, and hear you serve God, they glorify your Father who is in heaven. That's what Jesus was out and set to do. To bring glory to his Father once again. It's Matthew 5.16, isn't it? Let your light shine bright, that when they see your good works, they will what? Glorify your Father who is where? In heaven. Jesus was revealing who he was, the God-man, the all-powerful God-man. And he was also preaching and teaching and performing miracles so that his Father would be praised. 
Do you want to glorify God? How do you do that? Well, we see it here. The people were like, wow. When you hear about the Lord Jesus Christ and your heart says, wow, you're glorifying God. When you're amazed at who Jesus is, what Jesus has said and what Jesus does, you are glorifying God. Amen? I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. Give God praise in this house today for his word. Thank you, Lord. The last things I want to say are, if you're here today and you have not been forgiven, you are not in the Lord Jesus Christ, your sins are not washed clean, you have not been given a new heart that comes with a new nature, with new desires, with a brand new set of spiritual eyes, today's the day. Today's the day. See, I don't know every heart, but the Lord does. And I don't read every mind, but the Lord does. And so I just offer you today, there is forgiveness and newness of life in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is also the Son of Man. Right? Come to Jesus Christ if you haven't already. If you're a believer already and you are struggling with a specific sin, a certain sin, there is also forgiveness for you. But the Lord requires and empowers us to repent. That is to turn from that sin. And He forgives us. Amen? God is so good to us. Let us stand to our feet. We're going to sing to the Lord.